went to France for a year as a teaching assistant with a short-term contract. Then because of Air, an Air France strike, on my first day in Paris, I met the man who would become my husband. <laughs> and marriage is a long-term contract. <laughs> there we go. I feel lucky that he appreciates Montana as much as I do and that we're able to spend time with family there in the summer. About 15 years ago, I talked to an American who was living in Paris on a two-year expat contract. She summed up my situation by saying, you're a lifer. Now, I don't often view Paris as a prison, but that woman turned out to be right. I've been there for 24 years. So going from one year to almost uh, 25 years, that's quite a lot. As a foreigner, first in Ukraine and now in France, I've always been an outsider. And though this makes daily life difficult, being an outsider can be positive. We observe people and we have distance from situations. As we all know, being different and having a different outlook can be complicated. Still, for the most part, I find the cultural differences fascinating and feel lucky to draw from so many customs and inspirations. One thing is certain, without this experience, I would not have gained the understanding and insight needed to write the novels that I have published. My first novel, Moonlight in Odessa, is about the booming business of email order brides. Several of my Ukrainian friends, talented, motivated, intelligent women, married foreigners to escape poverty. In my second novel, The Paris Library, a librarian who has made a terrible mistake flees France by marrying a GI. Though the two novels are set in different countries and different eras, the themes and plights of the main characters, one an email order bride, the other a war bride, are essentially the same. In both, I describe women out of their elements as they deal with change, as well as the challenges of starting over. As a writer, at heart, I'm interested in journeys. I'm interested in the changes that we go through, the way that we at react to changes in circumstances, whether it be marriage, divorce, the death of a spouse, a new job, getting fired, having children, not having children, becoming an empty nester, breaking up with a friend, having cancer or COVID, or moving to a new place. Many of these changes can be exciting. A new love or a fresh start in an unfamiliar city where we meet all sorts of people and take on new challenges. Sometimes the changes are painful. The death of a loved one or being far from home means that we miss out on some milestones. For many years, I was a member of WOAC, or Women of the American Church. I appreciated the group at the time because you didn't have to be a woman, you didn't have to be American, and you didn't have to go to church. <laughs> a German friend and I co-hosted a monthly coffee get-together for recent arrivals to Paris. It was a lifeline to flailing newcomers who thought that they'd move to the romantic city of light only to find that Paris is a big city, like any other, with challenges of its own. A woman from Moscow who often attended lamented that there were no such Russian communities in Paris. I realized that this was America's strength, gathering, organizing, helping, reaching out, listening, guiding, creating space, continuing to learn and grow, kind of like us today. Thank you for coming out. This is really the best thing that we can do for ourselves and for others, to offer our knowledge, to share our experience, to accept the gift of friendship, and to listen to those who have come before us on this journey. I think this is why I love reading so much, whether it be memoir, nonfiction, or historical fiction, because I just love to learn. In my writing, I'm interested in exploring how we go through, get through, breeze through, or struggle through how we find the answers, whether it be from books or on the internet, advice from friends or family, or going it alone. What makes us feel at home? What makes it feel as if we will never quite fit in? And how do these moments of discomfort push us to grow? We've all been through changes, whether it's moving to a new place or dealing with COVID. The only constant these days seems to be about change. 
And COVID did force big changes on us with events delayed, downsized or canceled, as well as travel put on hold. 2020 was definitely the year we all learned to Zoom. It became our way to connect. And it's incredible to me to think about how many people and industries adapted, adapted, pivoted to adapt to change. I did 200 online bookstore, I did 200 online events with libraries and bookstores and book clubs. So it is especially thrilling to have my second um, in-person presentation with you today. <laughs> Thank you again for coming out, I sure appreciate it. We're all getting used to this new normal. Uh, many of us have had time to slow down and ask ourselves what we want and what is important, how we want to live, what goals will we make for ourselves. Um, I can tell you that over the past few years, I've become a hunchback because I spend so much time in front of my computer. Um, and I've become a hermit because I've just kind of forgotten how to talk to folks. So my goal is to spend more time in real life with people and to take more classes. I, I signed up for flamenco classes. Ole. And I'd like to finish my work in progress by December 1st. I'm really lucky that work is a pleasure. In difficult times, I take solace in researching my real-life characters and learning how they adapted to change. I find joy in writing about them and would like to share some photos of the librarians in my second novel, The Paris Library. I pitched this book to agents as It's World War II. Paris is occupied. There's a war on words. It's Nazis versus librarians. And the librarians win. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna try to work this and wish me luck. All right, so I just wanna get you situated a little bit. Here we are in uh, beautiful Paris. In 1939, a lot of this green space would be filled in with buildings now. Um, so let's first look at uh, the blue arrow. The blue arrow shows the neighborhood of my character, Odile. If you read the book, you know that she lives across the street from the St. Lazarus train station. Let me see if I can. Here it is, there we go. So this is her neighborhood just right here that I'm talking about. So she lives across from that, the, the train station, the saint Lazare train station. On her work, on her way to work, she passes the St. Augustine Church with the Ebony Dome. And then she turns up a narrow side street, the Rue de Téhéran or Tehran Street. Next to this area is Parc Monceau where she and her beau go for walks in the book. If we move to the green arrow, you'll see a small island on the Seine River. You can see Notre Dame there. There we go. So right there in the middle is Notre Dame. Now, in the shadow of Notre Dame is the Polish library, which still exists today. If you read the book, you know that on day three of the occupation, the Nazis, stole, the Nazis stormed into the Polish library and stole its archives. A few weeks later, the Nazis stormed into the Russian library and stole its books and archives. They then stormed into the Ukrainian library and they not only pillaged the books, they kidnapped the Ukrainian librarian. So you can see why the librarians at the American Library in Paris were nervous. We'll step away from that for a minute. Let's look at the black arrow. This is a modern time. Uh, let me see. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right, so again, we see a train station, um, but this time uh, the train station is the Gare de Lyon, and that's where my husband works. Uh, he's a train driver, so it's nice that we live just 20 minutes from his work. We live in Bercy. This is a neighborhood where 19th century wine warehouses have been converted into shops and restaurants, thanks to an urban renewal program. So here, right where the mouse is, that's a church. And by the church, you can see these railway crossings. Now, the Nazis wanted to bomb the railway, 
but they missed and got the church. The church has since been, uh, has since been uh, rebuilt. But I just wanted to situate you a little bit in Paris, the, f the fact and fiction. So you see where the library was at the time, where you see where I live today. All right, moving on. So this is the library in 1939. Staff comes from the US, Canada, France, Switzerland, and England. Our story starts here. Now, this library is called the American Library in Paris. So people sometimes ask me, why did you call your book the Paris Library instead of the American Library in Paris? There are two reasons. First, the library is very much a Parisian library. In its membership, 60 nationalities are represented, and 25% of the members are French. Staff has always been international. Second, when the library was created, it was known as the Paris Library. The American Library in Paris was born of war. When America joined World War I in 1917, the American Library Association mobilized and sent one million books to soldiers in Europe. Some of these books were housed in the depot in Paris, or the Paris Library. After the war, Parisians wanted the library to continue. And the American Library in Paris project had a strong supporter in Charles Seeger, the father of the fallen soldier and poet Alan Seeger, who I'm sure you recognize as the, as the author of the poem, I Have a Rendezvous with Death, which he wrote just a few months before he was killed in action in France. Royals, royalties from the poem Rendezvous were used to support the, the building of the Paris Library. And I want you to remember this image because we'll see it again soon. Here we have an information card from the library in the 1930s. I worked at the American Library in Paris from 2010 to 2012. As the programs manager, each week I invited authors, journalists, and art historians to share their passions with readers each week, a little like what we're doing today. Now, fate is a funny thing. In 2009, I, my first book had just come out, and I was hard at work on another. But unfortunately, renovation work was set to begin on my building complex. Scaffolding and netting went up. I was shrouded in darkness and clanging noise. Over lunch with the writer Anne Ma, I learned that she was leaving her role as the programs manager at the library to write full time. She encouraged me to apply for her job. Now I'd volunteered at the library so they knew me and luckily I got the job. My desk was in an open space office, and I sat next to the collection manager, an Italian gentleman who has worked at the library since the Nixon administration. Now, he's very reserved, but he has so much knowledge, and so he doesn't really volunteer things, uh, he, but he will ask, answer questions as asked. And so from him, I learned the story of the brave librarians during World War II. And the minute he talked to me about this, I knew that this story was a novel, and I sat down to write it. I didn't want to tell my colleagues that I was working on this project, however. Um, so a lot of my research was done at home in the beginning, and I became an obsessive Googler. This paid off because every day, librarians and archives are scanning more and more documents and making them available to researchers online. One of the documents that sealed the deal for me is available to you on my website. It is a report marked confidential about life in Paris during the occupation. It was written by the director of the library at the time, Dorothy Reeder. Reading her confidential report gave me chills. And I hope that readers of my book will feel those same chills as they learn about this time during World War II. Another document that was important to me was this information card. It was, the first in, it was the first image that I found of the library, and so it was important to my novel. It was the beginning of my novel, and it's also the end. I don't think it's a spoiler to tell you that my novel ends with lines from this card. 
the American Library in Paris open daily. So you can, you can see that this is the same image. Again, obsessive Googling pays off. I found this photo for sale online and immediately snapped it up. I, I should say, I was uh, for my first novel, um, Moonlight in Odessa, which was about email order brides, I did a lot of Googling for that book as well. So I was looking up a lot of women who had profiles online. And I'm really lucky that my husband never looks at our browser history because <laughs> he might not have gotten the right impression of, of, of my work, but anyway, all right. So I found this photo online, snapped it up. Um, I'll say that this book took me 10 years to research. I spent a lot of time at France's National Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which is located just across the river from my apartment. I read the Paris edition of the New York Herald to see how the war was covered. Turning the crisp newspaper pages, I delighted in the news of the American colony in the City of Light before perusing the ads for everything from cigarettes to girdles. I consulted back issues of the magazine Library Journal to better understand the concerns of librarians in the 1940s. I thought that germs were a recent concern, but it turns out that even then, some patrons worried about transmission of, book, of germs through borrowed books. And there was an article about how some people would be the absolute first to check out a book so they wouldn't have to worry about germs. There was another article about librarians who met with customer service experts at department stores to get tips on how to better welcome patrons. Of course, there were articles about quirky patrons. Some things don't change. Um, I have uh, read several memoirs of women who went through uh, the war, including journalists, a French madam who thought that the German soldiers behaved correctly, as well as a gutsy American wife who followed her French husband, a soldier, from army base to army base. I read histories and analyzed photos, and I interviewed women who lived through the war, my husband's French grandmother, I had a student at the time who was 80 years old. She was a Jewish resistant um, and a fascinating lady. Um, I loved her because she kept a bottle of champagne in her refrigerator just in case. Um, and uh, then I, um, I, I did a program called Les Petits Frères des Pauvres, the um, Little Brothers of the Poor, where I was matched with a neighborhood lady and I would visit once a week. And she too had lived through the war. So I was very lucky to meet several people who had um, those, those very difficult, challenging experiences. This is a, a photo um, that I, I absolutely loved, and it really inspired my book for the character, the fictional character of Margaret. I love the wide brim of her hat and wonder what secret she's hiding. If you read the book, you know that I stayed very faithful to the description of the library. For example, I mentioned the pebbled path, the row of petunias, or maybe pansies, the half-dead ivy in the urn. So these, these pictures were really important for me to be able to physically recreate the library because it, um, it doesn't exist in the same building anymore. I, was, I know, I was devastated. I, my husband and I went to go visit the, the old site of the library, and on that street, Rue de Téhéran, there's one building that was demolished, and it was the library, and now it's a big glass building, and, and Dannon has their headquarters there. Not the same. All right. So here we are um, in August of 1939 with war on the way. The US ambassador, William Bullitt, advised, in view of the situation prevailing in Europe, it is advisable that American citizens return to the United States. Now, I don't know about you, um, but if an ambassador told me to leave the country, I think I would go. <laughs> he, told, he, told these, he told Americans to leave twice, in, in the summer of 1939 and also in the spring of 1940, and all the librarians stayed. My English editor felt that uh, people read history because they like to imagine what they might do in those circumstances. 
So we have to ask ourselves, what would we do? Would we stay or would we go? So here we have a photo of the directress, Miss Dorothy Reeder, and her colleague, the cataloger, Mrs. Evangeline Turnbull, who are putting, uh, putting documents into the safe um, for safekeeping. Don't you think that Miss Reader is the most perfect name for a librarian? <laughs> So, in September of 1939, three days after war was, was declared, Miss Reeder created a soldier service. And between May of, excuse me, between September of 1939 and May of 1940, the library sent 100,000 books and magazines to English soldiers and French soldiers, as well as to Czech soldiers and soldiers in the French Foreign Legion. Soldiers wrote to the library um, to state their preferences, whether they wanted books in English or in French or both, whether they wanted fiction or nonfiction, westerns or memoirs, or magazines such as National Geographic. Some soldiers even wrote to ask for young female pen pals. I'm not sure how that situation turned out. But I can tell you that this was quite an undertaking. 100,000 books is a lot to send out, and so the library had help from uh, volunteers from the Red Cross, the YMCA, and the Quakers who helped prepare these care packages. And I can say that the library kept pretty good records, and so I know that the record for preparing a care package was one minute and 40 seconds. So here we have the occupation, which is beginning. I felt a thrill when this 1936 portrait of the directress Dorothy Reeder suddenly became available on eBay. I'm telling you, obsessive Googling. Every day you get different things. Now, even though this photo only cost $24.99, it has been the purchase of my life. While I was writing this book, I had a, it had a, this, this portrait of Miss Reeder had a place of honor on my desk. She spurred me through 75 rejections from agents. Whenever I was feeling down, I reminded myself that the directress had faced the Nazis. I could keep sending out query letters. <laughs> My original agent and editor rejected this book, and it was the second book of mine that my then agent rejected. I believed in the book, and so I sought new representation. It took several years of sending out query letters, five at a time, to land a new agent. So I will say if there are any budding authors in the audience, this is a reminder to believe in your work and to persevere. After no one wanted my book, everyone wanted the book. <laughs> it went to auction, and 11 editors bid on the book. I interviewed each one, and one told me that I would have to change Miss Reader's name. She thought I'd invented Miss Reader's name, but again, I just, and I can see why, because Reader is the perfect name, isn't it? So a little bit about Dorothy Reader. She went to school in Washington, D.C., and began her library career at the Library of Congress. She went to Spain to build an information stand for the Library of Congress at the Ibero-American Exposition in Seville. From there, she traveled on to France in 1929. She got a job in the periodical section of the library and worked her way up to the role of directress in 1936. And as much as I love this portrait of her, I will say that I'm glad that librarians no longer have to stand on, stair on chairs for promotional shots. In my research, words used to describe reader were vivacious, great sense of humor, and full of pep. She sounds like an absolutely fabulous lady. Again, in 1940, when the Nazis got close to Paris, most people fled, but she remained at her post. She sent away her staff for their own safety. She sent them to Angoulême, where they would be attached to an American hospital there. But unfortunately, the Nazis arrived a few days after they did, and they returned back. There's actually a document um, written by Dorothy Reeder about what to pack um, on their way to Angoulême. And I will say, chocolate was one of the top three items. <laughs> I love this lady. So during the war, she dealt with the Nazi library protector. Of course, that's an ironic term. It's, the, it's from the German Bibliothek Schutz. 
Dr. Herman Fuchs had full authority over intellectual activity in the occupied territory at the time. Now, before the war, Dorothy Reeder and Herman Fuchs were two bookworms who enjoyed chatting at international library conferences, and now they found themselves on opposing sides. Fuchs promised Reeder that she would be safe no matter what. However, for her own safety, the library trustees ordered Dorothy Reeder to return to the United States in May of 1941. They feared that she would be arrested as an enemy alien when the US entered the war. When Dorothy Reeder returned to Florida, she raised awareness and funds for the Red Cross. But she didn't stay in the States for long. Through the Library of Congress, she went on a mission to Bogota, Colombia, where she trained librarians. After that, she traveled to England with the American Red Cross to help servicemen. She bookended her career at the Library of Congress. In the 1940s, Dorothy Reeder worked on three continents. Simply amazing. This is another photo of Dorothy Reeder, and it's quite exceptional because she's at her desk and you can actually see her desk. Most photos of her at her desk, are the, the desk is covered with papers and you can't actually see the, the desk. She was so busy working day and night uh, for the library. One of the things I love about this, um, this photo is her telephone. Remember how big telephones used to be? What would she think of our cell phone today? It's really quite something. Um, the photo behind her is an aerial photo of Washington, D.C., her native city. So here is a photo of the Countess from Ohio. Clara de Chambrun, originally from Ohio, married Aldebert Chambrun, a French count. The Countess was one of the first trustees of the library in 1920, along with the writer Edith Wharton and the millionaire Anne Morgan. The Countess of Ohio did have her share of heartache. Her daughter, died of eight, her daughter died of heart disease when her daughter was only 18 years old, and she was buried in, a, in the Picpus Cemetery in Paris. When Dorothy Reeder was, was forced to leave France, the Countess from Ohio, Clara de Chambrun, took over the running of the library and she um, was the only trustee who remained in Paris the other, um, throughout the entire war. The other trustees were returned to the safety of the states, and I can't say I blame them. She, too, was summoned to the, to the offices of the Nazi book protect, library protector. The ALP had been denounced because its collection contained anti-German cartoons, and political cartoons and journals, and so, the Countess had to broker a deal with the Nazi library protector. And uh, I have, this, this um, scene came from her memoir, Shadows Lengthen. And in my book, I have that same scene, but instead of having the secretary who accompanied her, I have my character, Odile. This is another photo of Clara de Chambrun, this time at her house near the Luxembourg Garden. She too was an exceptional woman. She earned a PhD from the Sorbonne. She was a Shakespeare scholar as well as a novelist. She shared a publisher, uh, Scribner, with Hemingway. She also translated Shakespeare's work into French. This is uh, Boris Nechayev. And um, you can see that original slide that we saw. And this gives a little bit of the, of the scope you can see the building might be a little taller than you thought it was. It's taller than I thought it was. While writing this book, I worried that nothing would come of my research, and I was reticent to tell my coworkers about the project. Strangely, I was not shy about reaching out to total strangers and sent dozens of emails to various libraries where the directress and her staff had worked. I phoned and emailed people with the last names of reader, Nechayev and Ustinov, in hopes that they were related to the ALP librarians. Thanks to Les Pages Blanches, or White Pages, I learned that the son and daughter of Boris Nechayev, the Franco-Russian head librarian, lived a short train ride away in Rouen, Normandy. Now in their 80s, the siblings have very different views about their family. 
Their daughter, Ellen, attributed to the fact that she was born before the war and was old enough to remember everything. She was in the room when her father was shot through the lung by the Gestapo and remained at his side through his recovery. Over lunch with Helen and Oleg, my discoveries were also theirs. As one sibling spoke, the other one would say, I never knew that. And when they discussed their father, Boris, I had the impression that they were each describing a completely different man. As a young man, Boris fought in the Russian Revolution. Afterwards, he and his brother went to Paris, hoping to find peace, but instead found themselves in the middle of another war. His brother joined the French Foreign Legion and was killed just days before the end of the war. If you read the book, you know, you know that Boris was shot by the Gestapo. And I interviewed his daughter, who told me that he recovered and lived a long life, manning the circulation desk until he retired, and continuing to smoke his beloved Gitan cigarettes. This is a staff photo of the librarians at the time. And at the bottom, you can see Harcourt. Harcourt is a famous French photography studio that shoots stars like Catherine Deneuve and Gérard Depardieu. So it is really nice to see these uh, librarians um, get the star treatment for their staff photo. Here we have uh, Miss Reader, who I think looks different in every photo that I see of her. Do you, do you agree? Yeah. She really does. Boris is always Boris. And what's interesting is the countess is the countess, the directress is the directress, and Boris is Boris. We're all on a first name basis with Boris. And I asked his kids about that, and they, they said that he, he always found a common language with people and, 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 and put people at ease. Now this is the mother-daughter librarian team, Evangeline Turnbull and her daughter, Olivia. Can you imagine going to work each day with your daughter? Would you enjoy it or not? <laughs> Evangeline Turnbull married her husband, Captain Ollie Turnbull, in Manitoba, Canada, in 1915. Afterward, his daughter Olivia was their daughter Olivia was born. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, he was shipped off to war and died on the battlefield. When the Nazis approached in June of 1940, Miss Reader urged the Turnbulls to return home. Canadian and thus British subjects, they risked being imprisoned as enemy aliens. Such was the case for Phyllis Webb, the ALP's British librarian, who was imprisoned in eastern France until the end of the war. Back in Canada, Evangeline wrote, my life has been bound up with our library for 10 years that I have been in Paris through many lean days and times more hopeful and cheerful, that I cannot give up hope of returning to my work there someday. All three of the Turnbulls ended up in France during a world war, giving service as a soldier or um, giving service as a soldier or giving service to soldiers. It's an incredible family. Though the librarians lived through dark days, there were rays of light, including a library love story. Reference librarian Helen Fickweiler, a New Englander who arrived in Paris three days before war broke out, fell in love with a, a shelver, very tall fellow, named Peter Ustinov. Now, at first, I thought the actor had worked at the library, uh, <laughs> but I learned that there's more than one Peter Ustinov. The couple worked at the library until Miss Reader insisted that they return to the safety of the US. Helen had lost so much weight because there was so little to eat. Once home, she was interviewed for the evening bulletin and with a photo behind, below a headline that read, back from Paris, she hopes never to see turnips again. <laughs> she and Peter married, and I had the pleasure of corresponding with their daughter, Elizabeth, who was extremely helpful in helping identify people in the library archive photos. There we go. This is the library mystery. While, reading, while writing the Paris Library, I became fascinated with the staff of the American Library in Paris. 
At great peril, these librarians defied the Nazis in order to hand deliver books to Jewish readers. I remain in awe of the librarians' courage and their belief in books as bridges. In the decade that I spent researching the book, I learned the fates of each member of the wartime staff except for one, a Jewish librarian from Chicago named Jeanette Etlinger. She disappeared from the ALP and the ALA archives in 1939. Even after my book was published in 2021, I continued to search for her. This past January 2022, I learned that in 1939, Jeanette Etlinger wed British journalist Herbert E. King. So she didn't disappear. She got married. <laughs> Same thing when you're an archivist. So... King's 1981 obituary states that he was a retired CIA official and a war correspondent. He covered the German invasion of France in 1940 and continued to report from Vichy, France. He was arrested in November 1942 until March 1944. He was interned by the Nazis, first in Lourdes, France, and then in Baden-Baden, Germany. And I had to wonder, was Jeanette with him or had she perished? I hope to find a trace of Jeanette in the American Foreign Service Journal, which published a 46-page, four-month series, Report of the Internment and Repatriation of the Official American Group in France. It detailed the experiences of 145 prisoners, comprising Foreign Service personnel, journalists, Quakers, Mennonites, American Red Cross staffers, and their dependents. The group, as they called themselves, was made up of 85 males, 60 females, and included 11 children. These prisoners, whom the Nazis called guests of the German government, were imprisoned in a hotel. They were not allowed access to newspapers, telephones, or radios, and they were completely cut off from the world. Food rations were meager. The entire 15 months, prisoners were offered one egg each, only six times. As for alcohol and cigarettes, the supply was never equal to the demand. But finally, I found a trace of her in the journal. I was giddy with relief and dumbfounded to learn that even as a prisoner, she continued her work as a librarian. According to the journal, upon our arrival at Baden-Baden, Mrs. Jeanette King, a professional librarian who had spent the last five years on the staff of the American Library in Paris, undertook to organize a circulating library. At one time, it contained 1,200 volumes and contributed more to the instruction, recreation, and morale of the whole group than any other form of activity. As you can see, and as you probably know, librarians are incredible. So I've got one last, this is the, is the book plate of the American Library in Paris, From the Darkness of War, The Light of Books, and I love how the book is open like, a, like, a, like the horizon. I've got one more, quick slide to show you because I want to share a sneak peek of my latest novel. It's set in World War I France and features the American Committee for Devastated France. The group is known by its acronym CARD, derived by its French name, Le Comité Américain pour les Régions Devastées, CARD. Now these volunteers called themselves the CARDs. The French might have called the, the women wild cards because they smoked cigarettes and drove cars. These American ladies worked just miles from the front. 18 cards were decorated with the Croix de Guerre, the War Cross Medal, for services rendered under fire. This is a photo of my main character, Jessie Carson. Now, she's the library card. She was a children's librarian who worked in Tacoma, Washington, and later in the New York Public Library. Most of the cards were wealthy volunteers who paid their way to France. Jessie Carson was hired to create something that did not exist in France at the time, children's libraries. She signed up for two years and ended up staying for six. One of her libraries still exists in Belleville, France, um, in Belleville, Paris, and it celebrates its centennial this November. I've been researching this work in progress since 2013. I read books and documents several times uh, to help me retain the information. Early on, when I read about how the cards dealt with the Sp Spanish flu in 1918, I didn't pay much attention. The flu, who cares? When I reviewed the text in 2020, influenza took on a greater significance, and it struck me how timing plays a crucial role in what we retain and value. In my novels, 
I want to talk about the people, events, and choices that make us who we are, friends and family, first loves and favorite authors. And one of the goal for my books, and of our lives in general, I think, is the transmission of stories so that our loved ones continue to live on through us. We keep their stories and their ideas safe. My latest book is a story of women bringing about change. I draw my inspiration from the heroes I read about in books, but also the ones I know in real life. Thank goodness for the strong, brave people who have come before us who have tried to lighten our load. I think, for me, the lesson is we can't know what impact we will have on others, but by sharing stories, reaching out, creating community, we can make life easier for others and for ourselves, and we can help and inspire the next generation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. We have time. We, we have time for just a couple questions, and then if you'd line up on this wall, Janet will be glad to sign your books. Does anyone have a quick question? All right, then. Janet, please join me again in thanking Janet Skelson-Charles. Thank you. Thank you.